Well, ladies and gentlemen, the conference resumes, and it's one of the true highlights of our gathering to have an address from His Excellency Dr. H. Cecilia Bambang Udiano. President Udiano, of course, was the sixth president of the Republic of Indonesia between the years of 2004 and 2014, the first directly elected president in the recent Indonesian democratic experience. During that presidency, of course, a close cooperative friendship grew between the two middle powers and two democracies in the region, Indonesia and Australia. The World Economic Forum noted President Udiano's stewardship delivered Indonesia's golden decade marked by democratic development, political stability, high economic growth and resilience, conflict resolution and a robust international role. A truly impressive record. As president of the country with the world's largest Islamic population, President Udiano has become a strong advocate for peace, for moderate Islam, both internally and on the global stage. He devoted and continues to devote great efforts to developing closer relations between the Western and Islamic world. He has staunchly promoted and become an architect of military reforms and championed Indonesia's robust peacekeeping operations around the world. Dr. Udiano is presently chairman of Global Green Growth uh, Institute, head of Partai Democrat of Indonesia, remains active in Indonesian politics, respected not only in terms of our bilateral relationship, but regionally and indeed globally. And as the ultimate endorsement, Mr. President, I note from your biography, you have 8.6 million followers on Twitter and 5.3 million on Facebook. There are some retired Australian Prime Ministers who would truly envy you that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me please in welcoming our keynote speaker, President Cecilia Bambang Udiano. Mr. Peter Jenning, Executive Director, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, distinguished speakers and panelists, conference participants, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is always good to be back in Australia, and I wish to thank ASPI for inviting me to this important conference. I am honored to be here to join this, a distinguished crowd, senior policymakers, high-level military officers, and leading industry representatives from Australia and around the world to discuss key issues facing Australia's defense and security. As you may know, Geopolitics, defense, and security is in my blood. My 30 year of experience in the military shaped my convictions not only in defending my country, but also in the value of international cooperation to ensure our common security. It was these convictions that guided me when I became coordinating minister for politics and security, and then as president of Indonesia. I well remember that my personal engagement with Australia started way back in 1973, when as division commander of army cadet, I met some 20 Australian cadets to conduct joint training at the Indonesia's Military Academy in 
Magelang. I struck personal friendship with one cadet named Duncan Lewis, who would later cross paths with me at higher levels as we tried to sort out bilateral issues. Then in 1998, as a general, I remember visiting Australia to have constructive discussion that were useful to our effort at military reforms. Last but not least, in 1999, I also remember meeting with an Australian general at the UN headquarters in New York, where I advised him that Australia's peacekeeping operation in East Timor needed to be done in ways that would calm the turmoil on the ground, but also address Indonesia's sensitivity, advice that I believe was well taken by the general. I am pleased that during my presidency, I was able to work closely with four prime ministers of Australia to positively shape our bilateral relations, including in security cooperation. We experienced bumpy path, but we were able to craft a comprehensive partnership of our two countries in 2005, followed by the historic Lombok Treaty in 2006. The theme of this ASPI conference defends white paper from pitch to reality, is very timely and relevant. So today, I wish to share some thoughts on how Australia observes the Asia-Pacific strategic environment, its security interests, and also its strategy. I will also contribute my view on what and how Australia could work together with Indonesia and other countries in the region to achieve one ultimate goal, which is to maintain peace, stability, and order in our region. As a starting point, let me congratulate the government of, of, of Australia for producing the much anticipated defense white paper 2016. I am sure it is a document that will be studied closely by Australia's friends and neighbors, including Indonesia. We appreciate the transparency that is shown by Australia in the publication of this important document. It did not escape my attention that Indonesia was mentioned 32 times and that good relation with Indonesia is vital to Australia. I wish to assure you that the feeling is mutual. For Indonesia, Australia is not just a neighbor. You are our reliable partner for peace and progress. Australia's defense white paper comes at the challenging times in what politics. When I assumed the Indonesian presidency in 2004, globalization was the issue of the day, free trade, economic integration, emerging economies, global financial crisis, G20. But as I left office a decade later, it was geopolitics that consumed international affairs. Major power relations after a decade of or so of relative stability were unraveling. Territorial dispute, suspicion and tension zero-sum rivalry for access and influence, brickmanship, all these are assuming center stage again. I believe we are stuck with the this, with this situation, at least in the short to medium term. This volatile strategic landscape provides the back backdrops for the strategic outlook in your white paper. There are a number of points in the white paper strategic outlook which I highlighted. The white paper points out that by 2050, a predominant share of the world economic output is expected to come from the Indo-Pacific. The maintenance of peace and stability 
is absolutely critical to ensure the growing prosperity and the rules-based global order in the Indo-Pacific region. Another point in the strategic outlook that I highlighted is the complex interplay, the roles and the relation between the US and China, which will continue to be the most significant factor in the Indo-Pacific region toward 2035. In your views, the US will remain the preeminent global military power and will continue to be Australia's most important strategic partner. The White Paper also recognizes that terrorism will continue to harm Australia at home and abroad. Instability in our immediate region could have strategic consequences for Australia. In your White Paper, acknowledge new and complex non-geographic security threat in cyberspace and space. Indeed, they will be an important part of our future security environment. In my view, these are strategic viewpoints that are shared by many countries in the region, including Indonesia. I see a world abundant with opportunity, but also becoming more dangerous. The interplay between geopolitics and geoeconomics will be even stronger in the 21st century. I believe that economic transformation will be the greatest force changing the lives and fortunes of billions of our citizens, creating a youth middle class, livable cities, expanding markets, jobs, and opportunities. Getting our geostrategy right helps our common effort to secure shared prosperity. Conference participants, as Australia seeks to shape her strategic environment, the evolving partnership between Indonesia and Australia presents a good case of a transformed relationship that solidifies common security. To be honest, in the past, there were a lot of baggage between Jakarta and Canberra. There was mutual distrust and mutual discomfort in our relationship. The East Timor issue was a major source of frictions. In the eyes of many Australians, Indonesia was seen as an authoritarian state with human rights problems and a troubled country politically and economically after the fall of President Suharto. In the eyes of many Indonesians, Australia was seen as intrusive and harboring negative intention on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Indonesia. I would say that jakarta Canberra relations were similar to many conflictual relations that we see among states today. But together, we reverse that situation. We not only normalize the relationship, we elevate it and transform it. When I came to office in 2004, changing Indonesia's relations with Australia became my foreign policy priority. In 2005, I visited Canberra, where Prime Minister John Howard and I signed the first comprehensive partnership between our two countries. Not long after, we signed the Lombok Treaty, which transformed the, secu the security relationship between our countries. Indeed, our relations with Australia is among the most extensive involving an annual joint ministerial meeting participated by a good lineup of ministers covering different sectors. Indonesia rarely has this kind of relationship with a foreign country, and it is a good sign of how close we have become. Indonesia's defense attache told me yesterday that since arriving in Canberra five months ago, he has been kept super busy with endless engagement throughout the country with 
his counterparts in the Australian Defense Force. The spirit of military to military cooperation is very high. This is the way it should be. Politicians come and go as the relationship between our leaders and politicians have their highs and lows. Excuse me. The relationship between our military should be kept constant and cooperative. This is also true for people-to-people -people relations, which serve as one of the critical pillars for our relationship. I am particularly pleased that here in Canberra, when I, it comes to relations with Indonesia, we can count on bipartisan support. As a friend of Australia, I ask that this positive bipartisan support toward Indonesia is maintained for the long run. In our today's world, we are faced with a number of strategic unknowns. The unknowns include the outcomes of the U.S. elections, arguably the most consequential election in terms of its impact on international affairs. And there are other unknowns. What will happen in the efforts to roll back ISIS, whether or not terrorism will intensify on global scale? What will happen to the migrant crisis in Europe? What will happen to U.S.-China relations? Whether Arab Spring countries will hold or fall? And how much further will China keep pushing its gain in the South China Sea? In facing these unknowns, we always hope for the best, but we need to also prepare for the worst, especially considering the international community seems to be frequently caught off guard by where and when the next incident will come. Perhaps it is against this background that we see a strategic trend across the Indo-Pacific from Australia to Indonesia, China to India, Japan to the Philippines, we see many nations undergoing simultaneous military modernization, some more ambitious than others. I do not call it an arm race because that's not what it is. But what worries me is this, in general, the rise of armament has not been coupled with the rise of strategic trust. Indeed, the rise of armament has been marked by the reduction of strategic trust. This is clearly evident in the South China Sea, where a solution to the overlapping dispute are still elusive. As we attempt to manage this flashpoint, all claimants need to constantly reaffirm their commitment to peaceful solution through consultation and dialogue, and do it in ways that adhere to international law. They must refrain from provocative acts and would lead to conflict escalation, and do all they can to avoid miscalculation that could again destabilize the region. The strategic deficit is also visible in the larger picture of international relations. If we take a look at major power relations, we now see many fractured parts between the US and Russia, between Europe and Russia, between China and Japan, between South Korea and Japan. These are critically important relationships that had been in better shape before. When they go sour, world affairs become volatile. For middle powers like Indonesia and Australia, it is therefore important for us to promote policies that do not perpetuate this worrying state of affairs. Indeed, we can help to mitigate it. Indonesia and Australia can, can work together to ensure a dynamic equilibrium in the region, where seismic power shape will not lead to new conflict greater tensions, and the returns of the harmful division 
of the Cold War era. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, just as Jakarta and Canberra seize the chance to reinvent our relationship, we can also work together and work with other nations to promote international peace and cooperation. I know in defense and security meetings, we are constantly assessing threats and challenges. That is how we are trained to think. But that is only half the equation. The other half is called strategic opportunities. And while they are not always easy to come, I should say easy to come by, they do come around. Remember that Indonesia and Australia worked closely together to realize the G20 instead of the G competing option of a G13. It took some late night phone calls back and forth between myself, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, and President George W. Bush. But Alhamdulillah, in the end, G20, not the G13, became a reality. And today has become a, the premier forum for international economic cooperations. There is only a small sample of what we can do for a better world. Both Jakarta and Canberra are seeing more and more of their interests converge in economic, regional security, combating terrorism, and others. There is plenty of space to build a stronger partnership between us. Indonesia and Australia can work together to promote a rules-based world order. But rules-based does not mean preserving the status quo. We need to constantly improve our region's architecture, where we still see crisscrossing security, economic, and political structures that resemble a spaghetti bowl. We need to ensure that the architecture can keep up with the evolving situation on the ground and can help to increase cooperation, resolve conflict, and increase confidence and trust. I personally wish to see the Indo-Pacific Treaty of Amity and Cooperation come to life one day, something that I tried to promote during my terms as president. As the geostrategic crush, I should say, as the geostrategic chessboard moves, I must also say that it's important to maintain strategic transparency. In any situation where Australia or her allies decide to deploy larger forces, especially in the northern uh, part of Australia, with its weapon system and equipment, it is critical to communicate with Indonesia and other countries. If you allow me to be candid, I remember well that the first time I heard about the decision to deploy a U.S. Marine in Darwin was when I was asked by uh, reporters during an APEC leaders meeting in Hawaii. It was a surprise to me. Eventually, things clear up, but communication is important to avoid misunderstanding and build confidence and trust. Our cooperation also includes the effort to deter the rise of extremism, radicalism, and terrorism worldwide, especially in this digital era, which provides a unique new battleground in the struggle between tolerance and hatred. The Bali bombing of 2002 reaffirmed the compelling case that our national security are interrelated. Since then, our law enforcement officials have been working closely and effectively to deter terrorism. Both Indonesia and Australia also serve as models of open and free multicultural nation which respect freedom of religion while embracing tolerance and moderation. I know that Muslims in Australia feel free, respected, and welcome. And this is an inspiring example 
to a world troubled by growing Islamophobia. Distinguished participants, to fight radicalism and terrorism, we need a new mindset, new approach, new solution. I believe that the fight against radicalism and terrorism is connected to other parts of the puzzle. This includes advancing socioeconomic progress. You see, the greatest threat to the world is the fact that hundreds of millions of people are trapped in, in a condition of insecurity, ignorance, injustice, marginalization, which lead to helplessness and hopelessness. In some of these areas, fertile minds can become corrupted and become easy prey for radical manipulations. This is why I believe we need to work together to promote sustainable development goals so that more poor will graduate to middle class and become owner of a dignified life. There is a direct link, I guarantee you, between a more prosperous world and a more peaceful world that we want for our children. And the final analysis, two years after leaving office, I still believe that the geopolitics of cooperation is possible. I am realistic enough to know that the affairs between countries will always involve rivalry and competition at some level, and it has been for centuries. But I am also convinced that little by little, the space for cooperation and trust and goodwill can continue to expand in world politics. This is how Southeast Asia changed a divided region of enmity and violence into a peaceful community of ASEAN family today. This is how the European Union expanded from six to 28 member states in which was unimaginable several decades earlier. This is how the relations between the United States and Cuba involve today, and how the relation between the Western world and Iran may be changing for the better. In short, geopolitical cooperation is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that the Australia Defense White Paper 2016 is indeed a realistic and feasible document. I strongly believe that Australians may turn every single page of the paper to reality. And I do hope that the security, that the security policy emanating from the Australian Defense White Paper 2016 will contribute not just to Australia's defense, but also to stronger cooperative security for the regions and beyond. I thank you. President, thank you for that uh, thoughtful and in many ways inspiring speech. Uh, we thought a suitable way to thank you for your comments and for your commitment to the bilateral relationship was to ask Kim Beasley to make a thank you presentation from the floor. Uh, once Mr Beasley's done that, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you please to stay in place while I uh, escort the President from the room and we'll make a quick um, scene change for our next session after that. But uh, over to you, Kim. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President, for those remarks. It is an extraordinary thing that at this very Australian gathering, the most significant speech has been made by you. Uh, that uh, the content of that speech, its sound advice so delicately delivered, its complex intricacies the character of the geopolitical situation in Southeast Asia and globally, the opportunities for joint partnerships that you talked about in relation to that, 
that le displayed a level of sophistication entered into the Australian debate, which is important way beyond this room. That is a speech that deserves intricate study, deserves study in the private sector, it deserves study through the government. You pray when you're in office, holding a national security portfolio, foreign affairs and defence, that your neighbours understand you and can engage you. That is the starting point of a decent relationship. It is an extraordinary thing to me, because not all Australians understand Indonesia well, though we try, that Indonesia had for such a long time a president who understood us exactly, understood our, um, our, our sensitive points, our red lines, our ignorances and our strengths and knew how to manoeuvre between those shoals to respond and establish a good relationship. It's an extraordinary thing. I cannot think of any foreign interlocutor that Australia has had over the years who has understood us so well. The all I can say is we don't actually deserve it, but it's really good that, uh, that we, actually, we, actually did, we actually did get it. The thing that has changed most in the strategic environment of Australia in my lifetime has not been the rise of China, it has been the emergence of a prosperous, stable democracy to our north at precisely the right time in history. There are two or three gigantic struggles going on at the moment. One of the most, if not the most significant, is the struggle in the Islamic world. Over the next 30 years, it is going to be, in numbers terms, the Islamic community that becomes the majority community of the people of the book. So the three religions, the three great religions of the book, hitherto it has been the Christian religion which has been the majority interpretation and adherence. Over the next 30 years it will be the Islamic interpretation of the book which will emerge, but it is emerging with the Islamic community in deep dispute and uh, in lethal dispute. What a thing it is to have to the north of us the most prominent Islamic nation understanding that and working for solutions globally and seeking help as they work for those solutions. What a wonderful thing it is to, to have a man who's going to be influential for many years to come, who knows how to speak to the rest of the world and who also understands the geopolitical significance of the struggle of ideas as well as simply the movement of economic power and, uh, and the other indices of power in, in a region as potentially unstable but as a potentially prosperous as, uh, as the region around us. Well, we did get very lucky in, uh, in President Yudhiyono. We're lucky that he still has enormous influence, that he sets a pattern of thinking in the, uh, in the region around us and, of course, uh, in his own country. This is a very Australian gathering, uh, Mr President. We have got our white paper. It's been, this is a transmission belt. Uh, we've been hearing from the people who wrote it We've been hearing from the Department and the Defence Forces. They're addressing here Australian industry and the Australian academic community. They're working out how they implement this and incorporate it within their thinking. It's a very important part of the process of the defence debate here, which is a debate that needs a high level of sophistication because it is hard to get community focus in the right sort of way. It's an important gathering but it's an Australian gathering. And you've actually injected into our consideration here the impact of this beyond our shores onto relationships with others. You've given us warnings. You've, you've pointed to difficulties in the past. You've praised us for transparency. And that's one of the great things about the white paper for the neighbourhood. We are transparent when it comes to, to thinking through the way in which we plan and do defence and the way in which we assign priorities. It was wonderful for you to be here. I, I'm, I, I'm in amazed that you're here, 
but I am enormously grateful that you're here and you've brought with us your very good, uh, your very good Indonesian colleagues. But as I said, uh, mostly what we have to say at this gathering is going to pass into the ether. But the written version of that speech will be passed around and chewed over uh, this country for a long time to come.